Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Celeste Collins. I'm the Chief of People and Inclusion here at PHMC, and welcome. Thank you all for joining us this, this afternoon for PHMC's tribute and celebration of Black Music Month. You are in for a treat this afternoon. For the next hour, we're going to pay a tribute to Black music, Philadelphia style. Um, so our tribute, our tribute will focus on Philadelphia's history and its comp contribution to Black music in no way, and we recognize that we can't cover, cover this wealth of information in an hour, but we're going to do our very best to walk you through um, Philadelphia's roots to Black Music Month. And um, not only will we do a tribute, but it's also an education um, to the, of the significance of Philadelphia and Black Music Month. So I'm honored um, to have Tiffany Bacon, our very own employee who has roots to Philadelphia, who has roots to Black radio, who is currently in Black radio, to lead us in this important discussion um, and tribute. So let me tell you a little about Tiffany. Um, Tiffany Bacon is an actor, a radio personality, a health educa educator. That's right, she's a health educator for PHMC. She's a fashion and costume designer. She began her career in radio in 1990 while attending Temple University. There, um, she worked at the radio station there. Um, she worked at Power 99, a, a still very popular radio station here in Philadelphia um, for many years. And is now in her 12th year in Radio One where she can be heard on hip hop 103.9 and 100 point um, R&B. So it is my honor and pleasure that Tiffany's going to lead us in this discussion. And like I said, I know we can't cover all that we want to cover in an hour. So beyond today, Tiffany is going to lead other discussions and conversations around um, Black radio and just discussions overall. So I am honored. It is my pleasure. Um, I'm going to drop the mic and give it to Tiffany in a moment. Just want to give you some housekeeping rules, if you will. Um, you'll be able to um, make comments and ask questions. So for the next hour, the program that Tiffany has put together, and she put together this program designed for PHMC, um, Philadelphia style. So for the next hour, Tiffany's going to walk us through the program and she's agreed to stay on for a few minutes beyond to answer questions and respond to your comments and just play a little more of the Philadelphia sound. So with that said, um, Tiffany, thank you for um, willing and just being being who you are and agreeing to do this for us today. So um, I'm gonna drop the mic. And also Tiffany is with her co, one of her DJs from the station, um, DJ Tactics is joining us as well. So it's the real deal. Thank you, Tiffany. Take it away. All right, thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm, listen, this is my passion right here. I love music. I love talking about music. I love sharing about music. I'm a native North Philadelphian. So yeah, we have a lot of rich history and I'll do my best to get to as much of it as possible. Um, let me share my screen here just to give you what our focus is for today. So today it is all about Philly black music from classic to neo soul. So if you don't know what neo soul is, I will explain that a little later on. But first, we want to talk about this month uh, that we're in. I want to give you an overview of what we're talking about today. Um, we're going to give you the history of Black Music Month. June is Black Music Month. It has been uh, acknowledged as Black Music Month for several years. We're going to talk about where it came from, who started it. We're going to get into that from one of the founders of Black Music Month, as she will share that history for you. After that, we're going to talk about what is the sound of Philadelphia. When you hear that term, what artists do you think of? Do you know the backstory? Do you know the history? Do you know the vastness? And are you just thinking about the artists or the other things involved? Then we're gonna get into this bridge between classic and neo-soul. So again, you might not know what neo-soul is, a lot of people do. 
but we're going to cover all of that and what that bridge was, what was going on right here in Philadelphia to create that bridge. And then finally, at the end of the hour, we're going to do something um, I call the six degrees mix. So another famous Philadelphian, Kevin Bacon, somebody made a game about that man because it seems like everybody in the world is only six degrees from Kevin Bacon. So I'm doing that same kind of concept just with songs. So I'm gonna pick in four different segments, myself and DJ Tactics. We're gonna give you two artists that may not seem like they connect and we're going to get you from one artist to the next in six songs. So and I'll give you some backstory on those songs and those artists and how they interact. All right, sounds like a plan. Let's get into it. So what is Black Music Month? Black Music Month is a celebration of Black music that's been going on since the late 1970s. We have a treasure here in Philadelphia and her name is Deanna Williams. She is an entertainment powerhouse and music activist. And she is considered the godmother of Black Music Month. So I think it's best that she tell you how it got started. So let's check out this video from Deanna Williams. I know they're pulling up the video right now. <laughs> Kenny Gamble is actually, I call him the father of Black Music Month because he came to Nashville and saw what the Country Music Association was doing with the Hall of Fame and the Grand Ole Opry and was inspired by the unity amongst country artists. And after that visit, he came back to Philadelphia and along with a few other people decided to start the Black Music Association to kind of mirror what the CMAs were doing. And uh, I was involved on the local level um, in the local Philadelphia chapter. Chapters were created around the country. Uh, and because uh, Gamble and I have worked together on so many projects, um, I worked very actively to get June Black Music Month recognized in Congress and by President Bill Clinton. So I was hosting a music conference in DC and I wrote President Clinton asking would he host a reception at the White House, much like Jimmy Carter, President Jimmy Carter had done in the late 70s for the BMA, for the Black Music Association. And Clinton's people said, oh, we see where Carter had done this reception, but he did not sign the presidential proclamation. So why don't you go get some legislation and then come back to the White House? Oh, okay. I was shocked to hear that when I called Gamble and told him he was surprised as well. But I spent the next few years of my life lobbying senators, congressmen, writing um, an editorial in Billboard, uh, just what I call a high level of music activism, where I was in people's faces constantly saying, Black music is more than feel good. It's more than snapping your finger, bobbing your head, dancing. It is a multi-billion dollar industry. And we don't tend to think of it that way, but that's what it is. It's one of America's greatest exports around the world. And so I was successful with the assistance of Congressman Shaka Fatah of, of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia. Uh, took a minute, but we got the legislation passed that said June is Black Music Month. And then I was invited to the White House for a private meeting with President Bill Clinton, and that was pretty heady. And this all was on the strength of me writing a very passionate letter about my belief in Black music. And I say Black music equals American music. So I'm identifying it by the group of people who have created it, but it is indigenous to the United States of America. So it is one of America's greatest creations that has come from the wellspring of the black experience. And it's music of the world, but for everybody, but it was created by black people, gospel, blues, jazz, you name it, rock, rock music. You know, last year we honored Little Richard. He's one of the architects of rock music, period, you know, so. Um, Mick Jagger knows it, so does Eric Clapton, um, many of the British 
rockers, they cited Muddy Waters and others as their influences. And so that body of music, all genres, all variations of it, I love and I advocate for that. And so uh, after I got the legislation passed and met with President Clinton several times in the Oval Office, I felt like we were on our way. And somewhere around the world, there has been some recognition or celebration of June Black Music Month. So I call Kenny Gamble the father of Black Music Month. Others have called me the mother. I take it. I have nurtured this baby. I have breastfed. I've made food from scratch. I have raised this child and will continue to do until I have my breath in me. Thank you for that. Deanna Williams is, um, as you heard her share, she is the godmother of Black Music Month. And I'm happy to call her a mentor. She has been doing this thing for such a long time. <laughs> uh, she has been a mentor to me and other media uh professionals here in Philadelphia. She serves as a media coach. So new artists and, and, and artists who've been out there for a while who need some coaching on how to deal with the media and present themselves in the best light, she helps them. She is also an event producer. If you know anything about the Marian Anderson Awards, Deanna Williams is the co-producer of this gala event that happens every year. It celebrates um, excellence in music. She's curated the celebration of Barry Gordy, John Bon Jovi, Wynton Marcellus, Patti LaBelle, Gamble and Huff, and Cool and the Gang, which was their most recent celebration back in October. And if you look at the screen here, this is a picture of Deanna. She referenced a reception that was held by Jimmy Carter um, for Black Music Month, and that is her in the middle of that reception on the lawn of the White House. So she mentioned Gamble and Huff. And when you say the words, the sound of Philadelphia, it's hard not to think of Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff. They are basically the architects of this sound. But you can't just think about these guys. You also have to consider the artists because they're the ones you hear on the radio. And who's behind the artists? The musicians, the writers, the studio. All of those things come together to create this unique sound that we have, that we can be proud of, that comes out of the city of brotherly love and sisterly affection. By the way, it's Deanna Williams, who now has our new tagline coined, brotherly love and sisterly affection, because we're not going to leave the sisters out anymore. So let's take a look at these three elements of the sound of Philadelphia. It's the label. Philly International Records was founded in 1971 by Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff. In their heyday, they earned 175 gold and platinum albums. 175. Highly influential music. You heard Deanna mention um, how British rockers, other musicians from around the country and around the world have been influenced by what we've been doing here since the late 1960s. When you think of the sound of Philadelphia, you think of the artists. How can you not mention Harold Melvin in the Blue Notes, Tay Pendergrass, the Jones Girls, MFSB, McFadden and Whitehead, Patti LaBelle, Lou Rawls, The Three Degrees, and more. When you think about the music some of the unsung heroes are the musicians themselves. They are instrumental to creating the sound that we have, why it's so lush, so, so full. And I'll talk about the sound of Philadelphia, how it actually sounds. But you have the writers, you have the producers, the engineers who knew exactly how to place the mic to get the best sound out of that drum, uh, the best sound out of the keys, the best sound out of the strings. So let's start. The message in the music. Long before Gamble and Huff were music moguls, they were actually artists. Oh, let me go back. <laughs> Moving ahead of myself. They were artists. In fact, uh, Kenny Gamble was a singer. Leon Huff was a pianist. 
And they got together and they became a writing dynamic duo. They created a lot of great music for Dusty Springfield, for Wilson Pickett, for The Intruders. And then they got together with a guy um, who worked with Kenny Gamble before he met with Leon Huff. They got with a guy and they penned this song for Dee Dee Warwick, Sister to Dion. They released the song in 1966. And then don't you know, Motown got a hold of it and it became a smash hit. That song was, I'm Gonna Make You Love Me, which was recorded by Diana Ross and the Supremes. A lot of times you hear the Motown sound, you don't ever think that there's a Philly connection. But with that song, there definitely was a Philly connection. Um, Philly International Records was often compared to Motown. There are musicians who were a part of the Philly International machine who described the Philadelphia sound as funk in a tuxedo. Think about that imagery for a second. I'll give you an example of what that means in a minute. One other thing that was very important, especially to Kenny Gamble, was the political activism in the music. There was always an element of Black pride, of self-determination. Um, you can hear it in tracks like, Am I Black Enough For You? We played that in the beginning as you're walking in music as you were coming into the Zoom call. That was a track uh, from uh, Billy Paul, came out in 1972, the OJs give the people what they want. And then long before there was We Are The World and other big like all-star records, Philly International did a song called Let's Clean Up The Ghetto. And it was like all of their major artists all in one song, including uh, Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes, including Lou Rawls, including many of the other artists that were on the label at that time. That song, wasn't just a song, it was also a call to action. And many other cities got on board with the idea of we're just gonna clean up our own area. We're gonna take pride in our own area because we live here, this is our home. So we're gonna work together to clean it up. We're not gonna wait for the man, we're not gonna wait for everybody else to come and do it for us, we're gonna do it. So that was an early indication of the blending between the political activism and the music that was also oh present in the sound of Philadelphia. The other thing that Gamble and Hub did really well was they knew how to find the right talent to match with the songs. So you cannot think about this music without thinking of the richness of a voice like Lou Rawls, of a Teddy Pendergrass who started out playing drums. He was a drummer for Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes, but you know, Teddy P had a voice that would not be denied. So he ended up being the front runner after a while and then went out on his own and had a very successful solo career. McFadden and Whitehead and all the other artists, the OJs, the OJs have a string of hits that have been uh, covered and sampled for decades. All of these artists make up that sound of Philadelphia. One group, who had already had a whole lot of hits and a whole lot of popularity, decided to come to Philly after they left their label. So in the mid 1970s, the Jacksons left Motown. They left without a brother. Jermaine decided to marry the boss's daughter. He stayed behind. Uh, Motown moved out to Los Angeles and the Jacksons were free to do music on other labels. One of their first stops was Philadelphia. They produced two records here in the city on the Philly International record label. One was Going Places and the other was the Jacksons. In fact, they had more hits from that album than they did their last album at Motown. Some of the hits were Enjoy Yourself, Show You the Way to Go and Good Times. It's by far one of my favorite Jackson's albums. Uh, it's also the first time that you see Randy filling in, <laughs> filling in the, the void that was left by Jermaine. Um, my, on a personal note, my very first concert in my life was the Jacksons and they were at the Valley Forge Music Fair. If you're old enough to know what that is and know where that, where that was, it was out in Devon, PA. 
um, a circular amphitheater and I got to see Michael in his like late teens, early 20s, get up there and do his thing with his brothers, singing music that was created right here in Philadelphia. The power of the sound of Philadelphia. So let's get into this music part. So what makes up the innards of TSOP? What makes up the innards of Philly International Records? First and foremost, we have to talk about the studio. Sigma Sound Studios was founded in 1968 by Joseph Tarsha, and it was one of the first studios in the United States that offered a 24-track recording. So that was revolutionary for the time. Um, they had session players. Those session players were often known as MFSB, mother, father, sister, brother. There were more than 30 musicians. And I'm talking about everything from the most in-depth percussion to the string section. It is the string section and the percussive beats which really identifies the Philadelphia sound. So if you listen to those old Philly International records, some of which you just heard, um, that identifying sound is that percussive beat they didn't use straight chords. So one of the musicians was discussing the difference between Motown and Philly International. Motown would use pretty much straight, straight ahead chords with a four on the floor type beat. Philly International, not so much. They would use jazz chords or they would have a little bit more improvisation with the chords that they used and the orchestration behind it, the fullness of the sound. That's what makes Philly International, Philly International, and that's what makes it the sound of Philadelphia. One of the other major portions of that sound was one of the main writers who penned so many hits. This brother right here, see him in the corner? His name is Tom Bell. He's a songwriter, arranger, and producer. He created Hits upon hits upon hits. Let me read you some of the hits that this man had. Um, Didn't I blow your mind this time from the Delphonics. Stop, look, listen from the stylistics. You are everything from the stylistics, which Mary J. Blige sampled in one of her songs. Um, I'll be around, like almost that whole album from the Spinners, he wrote. Um, he even had sessions with Elton John, and you can look that up. It's the Tom Bell Sessions. Elton John um, worked that out right here uh, in Philly. He wrote Silly for Denise Williams. This man is a juggernaut. This man went to Dobbins in North Philadelphia. Tom Bell is one of the main reasons uh, for the sound of Philadelphia. He is one of the architects. So let's just get a listen to what that sound sounds like. So I was talking about the orchestration. I was talking about that fullness, that sound, um, the percussive beat, and of course, the strings, which really bring that sound to life. So if Marlon or somebody can cue up that quick song from Teddy Pendergrass, this is called The More I Want. We're just gonna listen to about a minute 30 of it, just so you can hear what I'm saying.
hear that richness, you hear the strings. That's what set us apart from other music during the time. That is the sound of Philadelphia. So let's get into uh, let's get into this next phase. So hopefully that is uh, that's a groove that maybe your mom might have been cleaning up the house too back in the day. I know it was one of my mom's cleaning up grooves. So let's talk really quickly about the changing of the guard. At the end of the 70s, disco had an unnatural death, which changed the landscape of music uh, for a lot of soul artists, for a lot of artists who were creating disco sounds. The increase in poverty and the influx of drugs and guns in our neighborhoods fertilized the seeds of a genre of Black music expression called hip hop. 1985, really interesting year. It was the year of the move bombing. It was the year that the Philadelphia skyline was about to change forever. There was an ordinance or a gentleman's agreement as it, was, as it was called, that no building could be taller than William Penn's hat at City Hall. 1985 changed all that. That is when ground broke on what is now Liberty Place. That is also the year that a West Philadelphia guy named Spoolie D released the song called PSK, What Does It Mean? Some consider that the first gangster rap song. That song was influential to a lot of artists, including several on the West Coast, like NWA and Ice-T. And then somewhere in 1985 at the 52nd Street YMCA, a couple of DJs got together for a party that proved very integral in the, the DJ scene in Philadelphia. These guys were Jazzy Jeff, Cash Money, and Grandmaster Nell, who I understand is like the uncle to Meek Mill. Those guys got together and had a throw down one day in 1985. That marked the changing of the, guard, of the guard. There was a new foundation forming in Philadelphia. By 1989, Chris Schwartz, who happened to be the manager of Schooly Day, Schooly D, got together with Joe Niccolo, uh, a, a studio owner and engineer, and they put together a joint project with Columbia Records. That project was Rough House Records. Rough House Records, we're gonna talk about what they did. They brought hip hop to Philly. These are two guys from the suburbs. I believe they're from like Ardmore and Devon. They created this hip hop label, which cranked out hits from Cypress Hill. By the way, that whole Cypress Hill album was recorded at Studio Four. Studio Four used to be located on uh, between 3rd and 4th on Callow Hill Street. So Cypress Hill was here in Philly recording their album. They also put out the score, the Fugees. We all know that the Fugees blew up. That was a rough house record. They were responsible for Criss Cross and other big artists at the time. Now, what else was going on in Philly around that time? Not far from Studio 4 was The Studio. A guy by the name of Larry Gold, who is a former MFSB man, he was a session player uh, for Philly International Records, he set up his own studio. That was on the 400 block of North 7th Street. Many artists came through there to create what became the new sound of Philadelphia. Artists like James Poyser, he created his Axis music group with one of his buddies, Victor Duplé, who's a, a performer and a DJ. They created the Axis music group. While Rough House Records decided to move back out to the suburbs, that space was taken over by Jazzy Jeff, and he created a touch of jazz. Those elements became the foundation for Neo Soul. So what is Neo Soul? I promise you, if you ask any of, the, any of these artists on the screen, they'll probably tell you there is no such thing as neo-soul. Neo-soul is basically a term that we in the media and record companies created 
to identify a sound and to sell records. But the artists themselves, they just say, we're creating soul music. But to us in the industry, it's a new version of this classic soul. There's a throwback to the 70s in the dress, in the orchestration, in the way that the hits were cranked out. This is the beginning of Neo Soul. Here are some of the artists, many of whom are from Philly. And if they're not from Philly, they were in Philly for some time to record some music. You're talking about Jill Scott from North Philadelphia, music soul child. D'Angelo did a lot of work in Philly. A um, good bit of his album was produced by Philly um, producers. John Legend went to school here. He went to the University of Penn when he was starting his early career. Jaguar Wright, Kendra the Family Soul. Uh, Urban Hanks, now, he, Maxwell didn't record in Philly, but he was a big part of that movement. So let's talk about the Sound of Philadelphia chapter two. When you talk about a touch of jazz, that was Jazzy Jeff's baby. He brought together a whole group of talented producers. Those guys were Andre Harris, the Dow Davis, Carvin Hagens, Darren Henson, Ivan Barrios, James Poyser, Keith Pelser, and more. I'll talk a little bit more about the hits that these guys created, but they sowed the seeds of what is now considered Neo Soul. Then you had this group called the Soul Quarians, which were basically artists that had their own music, their own thing going on, but they equally collaborated on each other's projects. You see their picture right there. The Soul Quarians included Erica Badu, Most Death, Talib Kweli, Jay Dilla, uh, Quest Love, D'Angelo, Bilal, and more. Yep, I'm missing one person there. I can't see the face. <laughs> the Axis Music Group, again, I mentioned that was a foundation of James Poyser and Victor Duclay. James Poyser is a keyboardist. He's a, he's a multidisciplined musician, and he is also now part of the Roots crew. And we all know what the Roots do. They're doing everything. So in this changing of the guard, Dre and Vidal came out of the Touch of Jazz house Andre Harris, Vidal Davis, they're known for producing hits for Jill Scott, Glenn Lewis, Sierra's O, Usher's Caught Up, Chris Brown's Yo, Excuse Me Miss. Yeah, these guys from Philly are behind those. They even produced major tracks for Alicia Keys, Michael Jackson, and Destiny's Child. Carmen and Ivan, they created Karma Productions, also out of the house of A Touch of Jazz. They wrote songs for Jasmine Sullivan, Jill Scott, Music Soul Child, Justin Timberlake. Yes, Justin Timberlake did come to Philly to work with them and recorded here um, in our studios. Let us see Raheem Devon, Flowetry, Rick Ross, and more. James Poyser and Victor Duplay. I uh, gave you a little bit about James, but he's also created music for Erica Badu, Lauren Hill, for Mariah Carey, The Roots, and D'Angelo, while Victor has worked with Jamiroquai, Michelle and Dege Ocello, Incognito, and more. So I gave you all that background. <laughs> How do we get from classic soul to Neo Soul. So I went a little over time, but we're going to start this mix. Let me see if my, my uh, DJ, you put your, put your, uh, uh, I'm going to bring myself down here so I don't have that feedback situation. DJ Tactics, he's my DJ, my buddy. We work at Radio One together. So this is what we call the Six Degrees Mix. I'm going to get you from one artist to the next in six songs. So Tactics, can we just see you real quick? Before we get into the mix and let the folks enjoy what we have for them this afternoon. How do I find me? Can you see your face? Oh, just start video. There it is. I see you there. There yeah. you go. Hey, Tactics. Hey, y'all. Hey, everybody. Straight All right. I think I can hear you now. I feel like I'm in that commercial. Can you hear me? Can you hear we me good? Now? I can, can you? hear you. All right, All right. So this is the Six Degrees Mix, y'all. I hope you enjoy it. Follow the logic. See if you can. I'll give you all the background on this, but this is mix number one. I'm going to get you from Cool and the Gang to Jill Scott 
in six songs. Let's hear it and I'll break it down. Let's go, Tactics. So that's the Six Degrees Mix number one. How did I get you from Cool and the Gang to Jill Scott? Here's the relationship. First song, Summer Madness by Cool and the Gang. 
Song after that, Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince sampled Summer Madness for their song, Summertime. One of the first artists signed to a touch of jazz, Jazzy Jeff's production uh, company, was Jeanne. That song is called Groove Thing. By the way, Jeanne are Temple University graduates. Uh, so they were here in Philly. That song was called Groove Thing, which used the sample of Patrice Russian's Haven't You Heard? Kirk Franklin picked up that same sam sample for his song, Looking For You, and Kirk Franklin produced the song Kingdom Come featuring Jill Scott. That's the soundtrack from the album, uh, soundtrack from the movie of the same name. That is how we get from Cool in the Gang to Jill Scott. Let's go for mix number two. I'm gonna get you from Chubby Checker to John Legend in six songs. Tactics, let's go. Sick of love, it seems like we argue every day. I know I misbehaved, and you made your mistakes, and we both still got room left to grow. And though love sometimes hurts, I still put you first, and we'll make this thing work. But I think we should take it slow. We're just ordinary people. All right, that's your Six Degrees Mix from Chubby Checker to John Legend. How did we get there? Started off with the twist, Chubby Checker. One of Chubby Checker's arrangers was that guy I mentioned earlier, Tom Bell, who wrote Ready or Not for the Delphonics. The Fugees, Rough House Records, sampled Ready or Not for their album. One of the breakout stars from the Fugees, Lauren Hill. She had the song, Everything is Everything. There was a young Penn student playing the piano on that song in the beginning, who had his first vocal appearance on a song by us, uh, on the song Selfish from Slum Village. That's the first time he had a vocal feature. 
And then of course, he became a big name star, John Legend with Ordinary People. That's how you get from Chubby Checker to John Legend in six songs. Let's go for mix number three. Okay, this might seem like a stretch, but go with me. John Coltrane to Biggie in six songs. <laughs> six songs how did we get there my favorite things john coltrane who of course worked with miles davis on so what miles davis had a young percussionist working with him and a guitarist uh the percussionist name was james foreman who changed his last name to m tume uh working with a guy named reggie lucas on guitar they penned a hit for Stephanie Mills called I Never Knew Love Like This. Then they decided to form a group simply called M2 May, which gave you Juicy Fruit, which Puffy sampled for Biggie's Juicy. 
That's your six degrees. Our last mix for today, our final mix uh, in our presentation. Roll with me on this, y'all. I'm going to get from David Bowie to Music Soul Child in six songs. Tactics, let's go. Number four, 
How to get from David Bowie to Music Soul Child? How did we get there? Starting with David Bowie's fame, that album was recorded right here in Philadelphia at Sigma Sound Studios. One of David Bowie's background singers was Luther Vandross, who was also a featured singer for the group Change. You heard the song Glow of Love, which Janet Jackson sampled for her song All For You. On the same album as All For You was Doesn't Really Matter. Doesn't Really Matter also appeared on the Nutty Professor 2 soundtrack with a young man from Philadelphia whose name was Music. Just Friends was also on that soundtrack. Uh, that song was produced by Carvin Hagen and Ivan Barrios for Touch of Jazz, taking you all the way back around to the Rough House Records that we mentioned before. That is your Six Degrees Mix. DJ Tactics, thank you. He is at Radio One right now. Um, glad you guys enjoyed the mix. As you continue um, to enjoy and celebrate Black music, remember that it is vast and all roads lead to and through Philly one way or another. So let's continue to celebrate our music. Thank you. We're not quite done yet, Tiffany. So Tiffany's gonna hang out with us for a few minutes. Um, she's agreed to, so all of you that can hang out with us, um, Marlon's going to pose some of the questions that came up through, uh, you know, through her presentation, and then we'll end with um, thanking um, thanking Tiffany in the right way. Um, but I think we have a, a few comments, many, many, many comments, and many. Okay. I'll hand the mic over to Marlon. Awesome. Thanks, Celeste. Yeah, to Celeste's point, many, many comments. People are loving it. Can you feel the virtual applause? <laughs> it's happening. It's happening. Yeah. Um, so yeah. thank you, Tiffany. We got, uh, you educated us. You took us to school and you made us dance at the same time. Awesome. And so we have just a couple questions. Um, and before we dive deep into some of the, the, the very specific musical questions, I want to ask you, um, just some questions about you, first and foremost, um, because you certainly demonstrated your expertise, your knowledge, and your passion of, of music, in particular music in Philadelphia. So the first question is, how did you get into radio? And it's two part. And, and what was it that drew you to a career in radio? Oh, interesting. Uh, I'll keep it brief. I was a kid that liked to talk a lot to the point where I got on my mom's nerves. So uh, when I was six, she brought me a tape recorder and she said, here, talk to this. So I literally would walk around the house talking into a tape recorder all day long, uh, making sketches, uh, recording Saturday Night Live. And I was too young to be up watching that, but I did. But I would record like Gilda Radner and all those folks and retell their stories. So by the time I got to college, I knew I wanted a career in media, um, but I thought I wanted to be a filmmaker but they had some work study money. So I took a job at RTI. Somebody said, oh, you have a nice voice. You can, should consider being on air. So I took them up on the challenge. And 30 years later, here I am. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. This next question is, you know, you have, you've been in radio to see um, tremendous changes, changes in the new influences. What's your perspective of the future of Black radio and how does it remain relevant? Wow. Um, well, we have to get with the program in terms of follow the technology. You know, we, uh, a lot of people don't listen to over the air radio as much as they used to, but we have these platforms here, you know, so we stream a lot of times we'll stream our content online to reach audiences who may not own a radio anymore. So there's still great music that's being produced. These artists need venues. They need uh, a place and space to be heard. So as long as people are creating music, then there will be a need for us. Um, and we just, you know, we also have to adapt and pivot with the way that technology is going, but there's always a need for radio because there's always music. Awesome, thank you, thank you. So back to Philly for a second. Mm -hmm. um, what's Philadelphia's presence in, black, in the black music scene today? Um, and where do you think, what would you recommend, where do aspiring artists go? Uh, that's a hard question because I'm not as deeply entrenched in the scene now as I once was. One of the things that, uh, you know, everything is virtual now, and this is before COVID, but one of the things that made the Philly International 
era big and made the neo soul movement big was that you had a wonderful marriage between radio and live performance venues music should be experience you know we need to see folk do it and those old school performers they spent a lot of hours perfecting their craft they weren't a, they weren't going to get on stage sounding terrible looking terrible steps not together everything was in sync so you put in that much work you need a place to be seen so we don't have as many venues in philly now again this is even prior to covid you don't have as many venues to showcase these new artists um, and not as many, you know, uh, labels and whatnot, label adjacent people that are currently around to pick up the folks that are here. Folks that are, are doing it now are finding other ways to do it. You know, they're using their online mediums more than the in-person, but that makes a big difference when someone can actually say, oh, Tuesday night, I'm going to go see such and such at such and such club. That makes a big difference. I think I have one more here for you. Um, what does music mean to people of color? Oh Lord, everything. It's <laughs> it's uh, it's it's expression of self. It's it's revolutionary. It's uh, you know, it's a way to get things done. Um, the drum was a means of communication during slavery when we didn't have language to use. We were separated um, from other people of our tribes. Um, it was a way to say, hey, this is the time to get to freedom. Uh, it's a clarion call. Uh, it's a stress reliever. Like since, since the uprising and since the, the shutdown, we have leaned on music to give us an elixir. We have leaned on music to kind of to help us deal with the emotions that we have around what's going on. That's why we clamor to verses on Instagram to see our favorite artists get together and just like play their songs. And, you know, we get some healing out of that. Um, we, we, we watch the DJs spin online, you know, tactics, Folks like Tactics, they're just out there like, yo, this helps you feel good. Um, there's a message in the music. You know, we see that with um, especially Gamble and Huff and other folks right now. There's a song that I wanted to upload, but I, I got too late in my preparation by Janelle Monet called Hell You Talking About. And the whole song is just, hey, say these people's names, all these people who were killed uh, by police, all these people all these black folks who uh, were murdered say their names. And that's what the song is, you know, and it has this haunting beat. So I encourage anybody to look it up so you can check that out. Um, but yeah, it's everything. Music is everything. There's, one, so Marlon, that. there's a question there about um, radio, where there is gospel um, radio now. Is this Radio One have a gospel presence today, Tiffany? Uh, we not on uh, over the air, but you can find praise online uh, or on an HD channel. So if you have HD radio, you can get it there. Mm -hmm. um, our competitor station across the road. <laughs> at, uh, they're not Clear Channel anymore. What are they? iHeart. iHeart. Yeah, so they have a new um, gospel channel. There's also Reach Gospel Radio that is around. Right. So, you know, you do have places to get mm -hmm. your fill right. of gospel music. Thank you. Thank you. So let's, um, an hour, an hour and 60 minutes, and we've been here for longer than that. I want to call out some of the, some of the comments that you should know, as well as um, your partner there, um, DJ Tactics, around people at t just making comments that how you have made their afternoon. Thank you for this education. They had no idea of our roots, of Philadelphia roots to, um, to music and Black Music Month. This uh, uh, thanks again, DJ Tactics. You really amazing. So what we saw today is that basement. You know, back in the day, that basement DJ and then um, that mixing. So thank you. I can I can remember that aging myself along the way. Um, great way to end the end in this week. Thank you, um, Tiffany. Great job. Um, so my question for you is, how do you do your real job or your day job? I think <laughs> your job as well. Um, Tiffany has a full-time job here at PHMC. 
um, and doing that passion. So it looks like you have multiple passions. Mm -hmm. She's a certified HIV educator for us. And obviously the passion that you see here is the same passion that she gives to the project um, that she does through her passion here. Um, the other call out that I wanna make about Tiffany, you may have, when we used, when we did up to a couple years ago, the um, Halloween costumes, she was probably the person who won those costumes the most. So goes to the background as well. So we're at the end of the hour. You were, you and um, your guest um, DJ were authentic. She was not aware of the questions um, and she spoke from the heart, but most of all, I'm hoping that you, certainly I did, you all that are still here with us, walk away with education um, about Philadelphia's Roots to Black History Month. Um, and and we, we actually look like we planted the seed here. Um, it, it's interesting, Deanna Williams, is all the things that she was, will add activists to her, um, to her resume as well. And it looks like um, you pay honor and homage to her. So what we wanna do is um, thank you, uh, DJ Tactics. We will do this again. Um, many of the comments are, do we get to do this again? Mm -hmm. we, that, um, we hope that Tiffany and all the things that you do, that you'll come to us again and we'll planning what that looks like so I, I enjoyed it so I enjoyed bring it. you back again thank you DJ tactic so what I like to say to all is for the next few days um, through the month of June um, as we said enjoy black music month but as, as every month it, as every day is we get an opportunity to um, enjoy Tiffany remind us when you are on I know I listen to you on Sunday mornings remind us of your spots on 100.3 and your other spots. Yes. Yeah, I'm on Hip Hop 103.9 on Sunday mornings. I have a talk show, um, yeah. That's Radio 1. And mm -hmm. also, you can catch me on WRNB on Saturdays from 10 a.m. until 3 p.m. I'm also on WRNB, that's 100.3 WRNB, on Sundays from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. So it's double shot of TIFF, two different stations, so on Sunday. Nothing wrong with that. So you did us proud. Um, you and, and DJ Tactus did um, Philadelphia, playing homage to Philadelphia's roots to black music. We thank you. Thank all of our um, employees for joining us this afternoon. And one thing for certain, we get to do this again. So thank you all. Have a good weekend and we'll see you again. Bye everybody. Thanks to everyone right. for making this happen. Take care. Thanks for watching. <laughs> thank you. Bye now. All right.
special in every way imaginable. You want me from my hair follicle to my toenails. You got me feeling like the breeze, easy and free and lovely and clean. Paul, when you touch me, I just can't control it. When you touch me, I just can't hold it. The emotion inside.
I've never been brave to feel this way. A little something to get me through this thing. Uh, give me a little thing. Don't talk bad. Gotta get it. 
down low My hair ain't ever hung down to my shoulders And it might not grow You never know I'm clear. 